Okay, recording is on. Welcome back everyone. This is our second lecture for BC 308 Revelation and Daniel. Uh, we are um, working through Revelation chapter two and let's see how far we go. So we looked at the Lord's uh, first, uh, the message to the church in Ephesus. Uh, any questions so far, any thoughts on that? Uh, the church in Ephesus, uh, what the Lord spoke to them. Everyone's doing fine with that. Okay. Let's go forward now with the next church in Smyrna. So this is uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Could somebody read that for us, please? Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. I'll read first. Go ahead. And to the Thanks. angel of the and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, says the first and last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulations and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer indeed. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. You who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Mm. Thank you. So the church in Smyrna. Um, it's also very interesting as we look at these seven churches, how the Lord introduces himself to each one of the seven churches. You know, uh, there's a very interesting way, like in Ephesians, to the church in Ephesians, he says, look, I'm the one who holds the seven stars and I walk in the midst of the seven candlesticks, um, depicting that, you know, he's watching over these churches. To the church in Smyrna, he says, and the first to the last, the dead, the one who was dead, and I'm alive. He's, you know, so he's talking about his um, his uh, eternal nature, first and last, beginning and the end, always who was and always is. And also in that he died, but he's alive. He's a risen Lord. So he, he's, he's introducing himself that way to the church in Smyrna. Now, the church in Smyrna, we see that um, this was a church that was going through a lot of hardship. And the Lord is very mindful of that. They were going through a lot of tribulation, a lot of persecution, a lot of opposition. And uh, they seem to be facing a lot of opposition from people uh, who try to identify oh, who he, he says here yeah, they are they say they are Jews but they're really the synagogue of Satan the word synagogue simply means an assembly a group of it's like the devil's group and this is Revelation 2 verse 9 uh, and uh, so it's very likely that uh, uh, these were people who were troubling attacking harassing opposing the believers at Smyrna and uh, they were blaspheming or speaking out against the believers. So the church of Smyrna was going through the tribulation, but, and it's possibly also, as he mentions in verse nine and poverty, that means perhaps they're going through, you know, financially they may not have been very, very well off, but the Lord to see you and poverty, but you're really rich. You are right. So, I mean, spiritually, they were very well, doing very well. So spiritually, this church was doing very well. But in the natural, they were going through these challenges, right? They were facing tribulation, opposition from these people. Uh, they may not have had a lot of money. So in, the, in that natural sense, there was poverty. But in the spiritual sense, they were very rich. And the other good thing we see about the church of Smyrna is, gee, the Lord says, I know your works. That means they were diligent in serving the Lord. They continued doing what the Lord wanted them to do. 
But the Lord warns these people. He says, you know, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison, meaning you're going to face even more um, attacks to the point where some of you are going to be put into prison and you'll be tested. Verse 10, Revelation 2, 10, but I want you to be faithful to death. I'll give you the crown of life. Who's speaking? The one who conquered death. He said, I am dead. I came to life. You be faithful to death. I'll give you the crown of life, meaning I'll give you this eternal life. Just be faithful. And uh, now I just want to want us to think about something. I don't actually have an answer for this. There is a church in Smyrna. There is a church in Philadelphia. So out of the seven churches, there are only two churches to whom the Lord does not say you have to repent of anything. So out of the seven churches, only two churches. For all the other others, the other five, he tells them you have to repent. Some, there are things that are wrong. But only two, the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia, which we will see in chapter 3, there is no call to repentance, meaning uh, the, Lord's like, the Lord is finding nothing there in these two churches that he needs to tell them to repent of, which is, which is remarkable because all the other five churches, he says, repent. But what is interesting, and I don't, you know, like I don't have an explanation. The church in Smyrna, church in Philadelphia, if you compare them, both are facing opposition by the same kind of people. In uh, Smyrna, he says, uh, there is the synagogue of Satan. People who are pretend to, pretending to be Jews who are troubling you. Same thing he says to the church in Philadelphia. He says, you know, there's the synagogue of Satan. People are troubling you. But what we see is, in Smyrna, the devil is able to attack and put some of them in prison. In Philadelphia, he says, they will come and bow at your feet. And this is in Revelation um, 3, verse 9. He says, I will make them come and worship at your feet. So imagine the enemies of the church are coming and bobbing down before the church. And as in Smyrna, the enemies are successful in putting some of them into prison. So the obvious question is, you know, why is there this difference? Why can't the enemies in Smyrna also come and bow before the church, just like the church in Philadelphia, because both these churches are doing well. There's nothing they have to repent of. Uh, and both are facing the synagogue of Satan, some people who claim to be Jews, but they're actually uh, opposing the Christian faith. Now, uh, why is there this difference? Uh, honestly, I don't know the answer, but I just wanted to point out this, this difference. I mean, we could think we could think of a few things um, why there is this difference. Uh, do you want to discuss? Does anybody have any thoughts? Um, I hope you understood what I said uh, in this. Um, uh, uh, did everybody understand what? what does anybody want to like just Thing, uh, try to share your thoughts. Why would there be this difference? Uh, two churches, nothing to repent of, and uh, yet uh, this difference. Any thoughts, anybody? 
uh, just feel free to share your thoughts. You know, I mean, I, I even I don't know the exact answer. I have some ideas, but uh, anybody wants to share? Thomas, Dave, anybody has? Yeah, so one thought is, and I, I'm not saying this is the right answer, I'm just saying one of my thoughts is that for the church in Smyrna, he says, they will attack you. This is verse 10, Revelation 2, 10, that you may be tested, right? So it seemed like the Lord was uh, uh, letting these people go through this testing uh, for whatever reason and whatever good it was going to do amongst them. The church in Philadelphia, which we will be reading when we get to Revelation 3, 7 to 13, seemed to be a church that uh, really kept to his word, kept to his word, uh, which we don't find mentioned about the church in Smyrna. And this again, just my guess, right? I, I, I don't, we don't know all the details, but it seems to me that the, that's, you know, a big difference between the two churches. The church in Philadelphia, he says, you know, he repeats it two times. You've kept my word. I'm going to make the synagogue of Satan. I'm going to make them come and worship at your feet. Smyrna, you know, I know your works. I know your staying through the tribulation, holding on in spite of your poverty, but you're going to be still tested. Uh, there is no commendation of, you know, holding on to the word. I don't know. So maybe there was something that the Lord was trying to accomplish, you know, or needed to be accomplished in their lives as they went through this testing. But as in Philadelphia, they, or the word brought that cleansing or testing in their lives, you know, this only, you know, my, my observation, I, I wouldn't put it out as, you know, this is the answer, okay? But it is a very interesting uh, difference, you know, this. Uh, and the promise there in verse 11 of Revelation 2 uh, to the church of Smyrna is to the overcomer, you won't be affected by the second death. The second death is the eternal death in hell. You know, we see that in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, um, um, when, when, we, when we read about that. So he says, you hold on to me, no matter what you face, be an overcomer, you will have eternal life. All right, so let's go to the third church. Uh, any questions here so far on this? Okay, you all with me? Okay. Um, Let's go now to Revelation 2, 12. Let's read the third church, to chapter, verse 12. That's Pergamos till verse 17, okay? So, could somebody read Revelation 2, 12 to 17, please? This is the church in Pergamos. Revelation to 12 to 17. That's for 20, is it? Or 17? Yes. Um, oh, sorry. This is still 17, please. Okay. 12 to 17. And to, and to the angel of the church of Pergamos, right? These things says, He who has the sharp two edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You are hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you when Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, which you have said those who 
holds the doctrine of Balak, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of, some of the hidden manas to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written which no one expects. No one knows except him who receives it. Mm. Thank you. So, go to Smyrna. So, see in verse 12, how the Lord introduces himself. I am the one, he says, who has a sharp two-edged sword, meaning I am the one who will execute judgment on my enemies. The sharp two-edged sword going out of my mouth, the word of, word of the Lord, which, which would destroy his enemies. So, that's the one who's speaking. And then he says, you know, again, this is very interesting. In verse 13, he says, you are in a place where Satan's throne is. So the church in Smyrna, he says, I, I, I know your works and where you dwell. That means I know where this church is. And the Lord says, very interesting. Um, you are where Satan's throne is. What does this tell us? This tells us that, you know, there is the spiritual dimension over the city. So this in this, in this case, of course, is uh, Pergamos. Sorry, we are looking at Pergamos, the third church. So Pergamos was a place, the Lord says, Satan's throne is. In what way was Satan's throne there? Right? That means it's, it's, it's the spiritual side over the city, the city of Pergamos. And even the Lord is recognizing that. You are in a city where Satan is having so much of influence. It's like he's got his throne there. He's got a very strong presence, a very established presence in that city. It's interesting. The Lord is saying this. So, you know, we need to think, okay, in our, in our cities, uh, in our areas or regions, we're talking about geographical regions. Um, um, what is Satan's level of influence? You know, Satan's throne is there. Um, and You know, I'm not. I'm not saying we should go overboard on it and say, "Oh, the devil is through, ruling here," and uh, you know, get distracted in that sense. But we need to be aware. We need to be conscious of the spiritual atmosphere and what the devil is doing in our region. And then the Lord says, "You know, uh, he recognizes that there, there's been a martyr there, somebody who's been killed. Uh, he mentions him by name, Antipas, a faithful martyr." That's verse 13. So the Lord recognizes those who have given their lives for the sake of the gospel. To the church in Pergamos, verse 14 and 15, the Lord is saying, there are two problems. And both of these have to do with the doctrine, the kind of teaching this church is entertaining. They are entertaining, verse 14, the teaching of Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam. Verse 15, 
they're entertaining the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So, so remember, we read about the Nicolaitans in the church in Ephesus. This church has given room to that teaching. So this tells us we have to be careful of what kind of teaching we entertain in the church or what we permit in the church. So as leaders, we have to be careful. What kind of teaching are you permitting to go on in the church? Here in the church in Pergamos, the Lord is saying, hey, there are two things. I mean, there are a few things. I have a few things against you. And two things that he points out has to do with the doctrine, the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the teaching. So the doctrine of Balaam obviously was a teaching that this church permitted that resulted in people engaging in sacrifice to idols and committing immorality and so on. So whatever that teaching was, this was the outcome. Verse 15, the teaching of the Nicolaitans, it doesn't tell us here, but you know, possibly it was, like we said earlier, something that suppressed the laity. And so he tells them, verse 16, repent. Otherwise, notice what he says. I will fight against them, the people in the church or promoting these kinds of doctrines. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth, meaning with my very word, I'm going to deal with them. The people who are holding on and who are promoting the doctrine of Balaam, the teaching of Balaam, and the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Then he says, verse 17, to him who overcomes, I'll give him a new name, a white stone with a new name. And so this, you know, I'm going to, that's, that's the Lord's very special uh, expression of personal love to each overcomer, giving you a new name. But I think the key takeaway, or two takeaways here from the Pergamos church is, we need to be aware of the spiritual atmosphere over our city. We need to be careful of what doctrine we love going on inside the church. You just can't let any doctrine come in. And the test is, what is the fruit of the doctrine? That kind of teaching, if it's leading people astray in, in, in their life, or if it is suppressing them, um, we shouldn't entertain it. Are you with me? Any questions? Okay. Let's look at the next church. We are going to go into verses. This is a little long passage, uh, verses 18 to 29. The church in Thyatira, please. Could somebody um, uh, read that passage for us? I know it's a little lengthy passage, uh, but the church in Thyatira, Revelation 2, 18 to 29, please. Revelation 2, 18 to 29. And to the angels of the church in Thyatira write, This thing says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brasses. I know your books, love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your books, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow the woman to will, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed I will cast her into a sick bed. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with dead. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the mind and the hearts. 
and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Titeria, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of that, then as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who cover overcome overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be taste to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning stars. He who has an ear, let him hear who what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. Thank you. So again, verse 18. Look at how the Lord introduces himself to the church in Thyatira. He says, I'm the Son of God. I have eyes like a flame of fire. And have feet like brass. Remember what we said from chapter 1 when John saw the Lord. Eyes like fire, feet like brass. Eyes like fire. Fire refines, tests. But fire also gives light, illumination, which means it's perversive. It, it is omniscient or omnipresent. And feet like brass. Brass symbolizes judgment. Uh, triumph, crushing on the enemies. So this, this is who I am, the Son of God, who can see, who can test everything. And I also judge my enemies, feed like brass. Now, to the church in Thyatira, something similar to the church in Pergamos, you know, so he says, see, uh, I, I, I know your works. Verse, verse, verse 19 it means you're a good church in the sense you've got works going on. You have love, your ministry, your faith, your endurance. And your works are increasing. Your works are increasing. He says your, your last is more than the first. So, you know, if you look at it in the natural, to church in Thyatira, verse 19, it's a growing church because your works are increasing. But there is a problem. What is the problem? They are entertaining a false teacher and a false prophet. In the church in Pergamos, they were entertaining wrong doctrine. Two kinds of wrong doctrine the Lord mentioned, the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of Ecclesians. Church in Thyatira, they're entertaining a woman. Her name is Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess. That means, you know, she's, she's going by that ministry or office of a, uh, of a prophet or a prophetess. So they're entertaining her. They're giving her space to minister and so on. But he says, you know, what she's teaching, or what was wrong with her? What she's teaching is actually seducing the people. It's drawing them away from God. And they're ending up in what? Immorality and things sacrificed to idols. And you can see here, the Lord is being patient. He says in verse 21, I gave her time to repent. And words like, you know, I gave her time to change. The Lord's being patient now. But she didn't. She didn't change. She's continuing to teach something that is drawing people away from God and taking them into immorality and so on. 
And so the Lord says in verse 22, I'm going to come. So he's the one who has eyes like fire and the sword in his mouth. He says, look, those who commit adultery with her. This is verse 22. So now keep keep in mind that uh, adultery, uh, I'm trying to put this in. A, uh, so adultery in the Bible, of course there is phys the physical act of adultery, but there is also Adultery is also used in the Bible to talk about a spiritual departure from God. So, verse 22, when he says, those who commit adultery with her, it could also represent those who are spiritually departing from God because of her teaching. Because the, word, you know, the adultery in the spiritual context is not just, or in the biblical context, is not just physical, but also spiritual. So keep that in mind, verse 22. And those who commit adultery with her, they're gonna go through, uh, integrate tribulation. That means they, they're gonna go uh, in, a, in, in how and how, in what way God is going to judge. But he's, they're going to go through a lot of suffering. Right? Now it's come to a place of judgment. See, see, when people sin, it doesn't mean that God is going to immediately strike them. He gives them time to repent and then comes. If they don't repent still, then comes judgment. And verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Eyes like fire, what do they do? They search the minds and heart. They refine, they search. Verse 23, I will kill her children. Who are her children? Those who are following her doctrine. So this is spiritual. He's not talking about her physical children. He's talking about those who are spiritually influenced by her, by her teaching, who are going astray, who have been seduced by her. So he says, verse 23, I will kill her children. I mean, they, they're going to die. And people will know. All the churches will know that I'm he who searches the hearts and minds. Then he says, verse 24, and I say to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, that means the other people in the church who have not embraced the doctrine of this Jezebel, this woman, and very strong words, who have not known the depths of Satan. You know, the teaching we hear can take us into the depths of God or they can take us into the depths of Satan. Think about it. And this woman's teaching was taking people into the depths of Satan. That means the teaching was actually taking them deeper into Satan. Think about it. So it says, for the people who have not given into her teaching, I'm not asking you anything more. Stay, stay like that. Don't get involved with that doctrine. Something to think about, are there doctrines in the church today? You know, like we saw in Pergamos and in Thyatira, are there doctrines that are floating around in the church today? Are there people who are promoting these doctrine, such kinds of doctrine? The real question is, are these doctrines taking us away from the Lord into things, into practices that the Lord said you shouldn't be doing? That's what's happening in all of these cases. The teaching is actually taking them away from God into doing wrong things, worshiping other things, giving importance to other things, committing immorality or doing things the Lord doesn't approve of, worshiping idols. People who subscribe to that kind of teaching, the Lord says they are the children of that teacher or false prophet or prophetess. 
And he's saying that this doctrine is actually taking people into the depths of Satan. Are so the questions, are these are those kinds of things going around in the church? And as leaders, we have to guard our churches from these kinds of things. The doctrine and the people who promote those doctrines. So we have a responsibility as leaders. Because you can see clearly from these two churches, the Lord wasn't happy with the wrong doctrine coming into the church or the people promoting the wrong doctrines being entertained. Okay. Finally, he says, verse 25, he says, you know, to those who have not subscribed to this doctrine, I don't want you to do anything more. Just stay there. Hold on to what you've got. Just hold on to what you're, whatever you're doing, just stay with it till I come. And to the one who overcomes, he says, you will have power over the nations and you will rule over the nations. Amen? Now, maybe let's, um, we have, yeah, we do have time. So can we um, go through one more church, which is Sardis, chapter 3. Verses 1 to 6. It should be easy, I think. We have only six verses. Uh, let's try to finish that uh, so we can make some progress into chapter 3 as well. Could somebody read that for us, please? Revelation 3, 1 to 6. Please. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet a few people in Sardis who have not soiled, they will walk with me dressed in white, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of the person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you. Now, the church, okay, I see Kiran's note in the chat. Can you explain verse 25? Okay, so uh, Revelation 2.25, um, just going back. So thank you, thank you, Siddharth, for reading chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, but I just saw a note in the chat from Kiran uh, asking for explanation of verse 25. So the Lord is telling the people in the church in Thyatira, see, they were doing well, right? If you look at verse 19, they were, they were serving God well. They were walking in love, faith, patience, so on. So they're doing good. But there's one big problem, which is they are entertaining this false prophetess Jezebel, or this woman Jezebel, who has... A lot of people have kind of, you know, I'm not saying a lot, but people have uh, begun to go with her doctrine and which is leading them into error. But then there are those people who have not subscribed to her doctrine. To them, he says, I'm not asking you anything more. Just hold on to what you have. That means that you're doing well, just keep doing it. And till I come, that means just keep going the way I want, uh, till the Lord comes. Okay. All right. I got your, your, so your response in the chat. Thank you. So chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, is the other church, the church in Sardis. It's a very interesting observation here. Again, a very sobering observation. The, the Lord, again, see who is, how does, how, how does he introduce himself in verse 1? He says, the Lord Jesus, he is the one who has a seven spirit of God and the seven stars. 
Seven spirits of God referring to the Holy Spirit. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 4. That means he is the one who is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And he has the seven stars. That means he's holding every leader of the church in his hand. In other words, look, this is somebody uh, who was anointed and was holding people in his hand. He's protecting them, but he's also holding them accountable. So the anointed one is holding us accountable. So you see, that's how he introduces himself to the church in Sardis. And to this church, he begins with a very solemn statement. Verse 1. I know your works. You have a name that you're alive, but you are dead. That's very sobering. He says, you know, church, I know, I know what you and I know you're busy doing a lot of things. I know your works. And you have a reputation, you have a name. That means you have a reputation that you are alive. You know, you're a vibrant, on fire, dynamic church. So you have a name that you're alive. But really, you are dead. Really, you are dead. Now, that, that this always, you know, when I read this, uh, I, it always uh, is very sobering. Because I should not think of our, myself or our, our, our church based on the works we are doing. I cannot think of, our, of ourselves based on what people think about us because you have a name, you're alive. But you are dead. What does the Lord say about the church? People are saying you're alive. They're seeing all the work you're doing, but the Lord is saying you're dead. Now, why is that? Because he says in verse two, the next verse, he says, your works are not perfect before God. So they're doing a lot of things. People are seeing what they're doing. They think, wow, this is a great church, it's doing all these things. But the Lord is saying, the works are, your works are not perfect before God. Maybe they're not doing what God really wants them to do. Or maybe they're not doing it the way God wants them to do it. So your works are not perfect. And he says in verse 2, there are a few things that seem to have some life. But they are also ready to die. Meaning there may be a few things that are okay, but even that's about to die. So it's very sobering, the church in Sardis. Now, the church in Sardis had a rich history. It wasn't like this all the, all the time. He said in verse 3, you know, you have received, you have heard. That means there was a time this church had received good things. I mean, they had received, so whoever the apostle, whoever the person would come to plant and establish this church. They had received and they had heard. That means there was a great time in, in the past. This was three. But somehow it's all, they've just gone away from it. So he says, you know, you need to repent. Now verse four, there are a few people who are maintaining the walk before God. They have not defiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white. So when you put all this together, it seems like, I mean, if you put all this together, or, you know, and I'm just drawing an inference, I'm not, um, I'm just basing it on these four verses. It seems like here's a church that has a lot of work going on, but 
majority of the people have defiled their garments. Only a few have not defiled their garments. That means the others have. That means these works are being done, either the, the works that, that, that they have are either works that God doesn't want them to do or they're being done in a very defiled way. Because that's what he said in verse four. He said, there are a few who have not defiled. That means the rest have defiled their garments with sin and things that God doesn't approve. So the works are happening, but the question is, who is doing the works? How are they being done? And are the works the works God wants to be done? If these three criteria are not checked upon, then the works that are being done by the church are not perfect before God. And I'm basing it on these four verses. And even if the church has a name that you're alive, the Lord is saying you're dead. Very sobering. So then he promises, you know, the overcomer, you'll walk with me in garments of white and I will acknowledge you before the Father. Okay. We will pause here. We're going to close. Uh, you know, each one of these churches are like, when you read it, it's very, very sobering. And I come back to this, these two chapters, read it, you know, because it just keeps us accountable before God as leaders. You know, hey, this is how the Lord is, Lord Jesus is evaluating the church. These are the things he's looking for. And, and we need to be reminded over and over and over again, you know, stay the course. Be careful of these things. And uh, because the Lord is watching. Okay, so it is very sobering. Let's uh, take a moment to pray and we will pick this up again next week and we'll move forward. Could somebody lead us in prayer and close, please? Thank you. Anyone, Thomas? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the wonderful day, O oh Lord, as we are studying about the churches. Father, we thank you for your mercy, O oh Lord. Help us to do what you want us to do, Father. Not our own things, but connected with you, love you, and to know your heart and mind to do what pleases to you, Father. We thank you for this wonderful time, O oh Lord. Let me equip more in your word. Holy Spirit, help us. We thank you. We praise you, Father. Thank you for the wonderful time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. We'll take a quick break. I'll see you in the next class. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks.